Thank you so much, Sumera, for uh, agreeing to come on to this uh, call today to discuss about women's role in uh, climate change. So I'm just going to uh, tell the audience about you. I'm sure many of them already know about you and the work that you're doing, but I just want to give them a quick introduction to you. So basically, uh, Sumera Abdulali is a very well-known environmental activist who has been working for many years on the issue of sand mining and noise pollution, uh, mainly. And she's the founder of an NGO called the Avas Foundation. And uh, she has been participating at various like environmental uh, related programs in different countries. And uh, she's done some really, really uh, meaningful work in her career as an environmental activist. And Sumera, I would request you to share a few highlights about your journey so far so that people have more understanding about the background that you come with. Um, well, I, you know, Pia, I've just been doing what I see in front of me as needs to be done. And I think that's what really all of us do. And I've focused my efforts on a few things which um, happened to be there. Sand mining because it was something that was happening on the beach outside my ancestral home where I grew up. Okay. And noise pollution because my kids were very young and I wanted to do something part time. <laughs> so I volunteered to do some typing. So starting from there, I've just kind of done what it, you know, whatever needed to be done and uh, discovered a lot along the way, met a lot of people who have helped to make these things more known in the mainstream. So similarly, I think the topic that you want to talk about women and environment is something that I just happened to encounter along the way because uh, you know it became obvious that uh, women were being affected and that there was a talk of environment as a whole, but not specifically on the way women were being impacted. In fact, that was never really. So that's really where I am. I mean, I think that's the way I would describe myself, that I've done what I could in topics which have stared me in the face, but I haven't been alone because a lot of people have joined and helped and made so, it happen. Wonderful. So like, seriously, like uh, all the best to you for the wonderful and very, very <laughs> meaningful work that you're doing. And I'm sure you know, especially after hearing this talk, more women in particular would be interested in supporting you on this uh, beautiful work that you're doing. So um, going ahead with our topic for today on women and climate change. Now, this was a connection that I personally have had not made uh, till a few years back when uh, I met this gentleman in Gujarat, in Ahmedabad, who was working specifically on this topic. And he told me how he actually goes to railway stations and you know, bus stations and other public areas looking for women, especially women who you know, were absolutely on their own, who are living on the streets because uh, uh, he has a background working in ISRO, in the Indian Space Research Organization. So he has a deep understanding about climate change and the broader spectrum. And he had understood that when climate change really like unfolds in its, you know, in its total like violent like avatar, women are going to be the first, uh, you know, uh, people who are going to be affected and especially women in the lower socioeconomic brackets. And that got me really, really uh, interested in this topic because I don't think we usually talk about women and climate change in one basket, like climate change is talked about separately and women's issues are talked about separately. So if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the connection between uh, women and climate change and how climate change is most likely to affect women, that's one thing. And the second thing is that what is the role that women can actually play proactively to reduce the impact that climate change could have, have on women in the future. Yes, Sumaira. Yeah, yep, yeah, well, you know, it's interesting that these connections are not really drawn and when they are drawn, they're looked at, you know, either you are working for women or you're working for environment, but you're not working for both. And I always right. consider 
that I worked for environment, you know, but it became clear along the way that women have a special role to play because when I looked around me as things happened, as I said, they unfolded, you know, I didn't really plan that I'm going to take up this issue or that issue. These things come, yes. you encounter them along the way. And just like you said, you met someone at a railway station. I didn't meet anyone like that in that kind of a dramatic way. But I did realize that sometime when I was working on sand mining, that there was a village where I was actually attacked and uh, nearly killed, you know, by a sand mafia. And one of the things I was told after that was that there had been some, of course, there was a fight between villagers as there always is in these things because, you know, some are sand miners and some are opposed to sand mining. And that's true of many types of environmental destruction that there's, there's always a split. Yes. So the villagers who had been complaining about sand mining told me that they had had a rasta band kind of a roko, which had been largely ignored and that they had said that there would be a landslide because of sand mining and that there was a landslide and that a whole village was destroyed after that, which nobody officially linked to sand mining, but that it was likely so. And then he described the landslide and what happened. And he described losing their homes and having to live outside and you know, doing without their normal possessions and the, the problems with water and cooking. And it became clear to me that many of these things were actually things which women were doing because it's the women who were looking after their homes right. and the women who lost their homes and then had to somehow manage even more than the men. Yeah. And I, uh, it became a case study in, in a study that I participated in done by the Amnesty International and some other in, international human rights organizations um, in 2010 or it, maybe it was 2011, that what the link is between women and the environment. So it's always, since then it's kind of been in the back of my mind. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, of course, you could say is the women I meet in cities because a lot of women are wanting to contribute in some way to yes. something. Yes. And in particular, they want to contribute to things which have to do with um, something that possibly can be done mm -hmm. without, without um, having to go and say, live in a village and become an NGO, right. you know? And I know that there's a lot of discussion about this, whether that's a good way of doing activism or not. But I have found that all types of activism are good because at least you're speaking up, you know? And there are a lot of women who have the time in cities who have the ability, the infrastructure where they don't even really need to work for money. They can do this because they want to do it. And so that's the second aspect of what women can do even going nowhere. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's also the very interesting aspect of, you know, what I think of say in, in firecrackers, which is an issue I took up where firecrackers you know, we've been struggling with this for a long time, how to tell people don't use firecrackers. But the thing that really worked, I think, and that was something which happened before I started working on firecrackers, but which set the mind going was when young people were told that kids like you are, are dying and suffering in those firecracker factories. And, uh, you know, there's huge human rights violations. And they felt empathetic to that. So I think if you take that as the kind of, you know, kind of, you, you could say parallel that kids sympathize with other kids because right. they know how these other kids would feel. I think women can sympathize with other women, whether you're in a city or you're in a, you know, in a rural area or you're rich or you're poor or you're whatever you are. I think you can empathize with the fact that there are some issues which women face and they aren't all about rape and, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the things that are commonly talked about as women's issues, they're as normal as the way you live your life every day, having a home which is secure, having you know, a place to bring up your kids, food, stuff like that, which people normally connect not with the environment, but with other things. Absolutely.
So that's the way I would look at it. And I think everyone has a role to play. You know, every woman. Yes. So in fact, I wanted to she wants to see other women live with dignity. Totally. Yes. Uh, in fact, I wanted to highlight a point over here. Uh, while this is not uh, directly related to climate change, but I think the effects of it have been very similar. And this is, you know, uh, the COVID pandemic that we've all experienced just now. And I think it's been very, very clear that when there is any sort of, uh, you know, uh, external intervention that disrupts society's balance, now, whether it be climate change or whether it be something like a pandemic, which people don't really know how to deal with, women are the worst victims. Because it has been very clear that the number of cases of domestic abuse have gone up. There have been huge gender stereotypes that have been playing out at home, I think, for pretty much all women, especially the ones living in uh, family uh, setups. And like, uh, it's not only the women in rural uh, areas who have to, say, deal with things like laundry or arranging uh, meals or, you know, carrying say, pots of water to the kitchen, washing floors or whatever, doing the sweeping and cleaning. It's not just a rural thing. Uh, at all. It is the same kind of thing I think women have to go through even in cities. And I think most working women, irrespective of whether they are corporate women or women who are entrepreneurs or in other roles, I think when they've had to live in this lockdown for the last few months, I think pretty much everybody's understood that the gender stereotypes have gone nowhere. The only thing is that women had a little bit more freedom of movement. But when that freedom of movement got cut down and this external thing happened, I think we've all we're all very clear and on the same page about the fact that the stereotypes still have to be dealt with. Now, my thing is that when, uh, you know, effects of climate change become worse in the future, and assuming that we're going to have more cases where resources are going to be impacted, I'm not even talking about things, say, like floods or droughts or something very major. But even if, like, let's say there's a certain percentage of water shortage in cities because of, uh, you know, uh, rising temperatures or water diminishing, even urban women are going to face pretty much the same kind of issues that women in rural areas face. So this is just a point that I wanted to underscore because usually our discussions are more about the problems that women in the lower socioeconomic brackets or rural areas will face. But from the way I see it, it seems to be pretty much like a global thing that is going to happen. So I just wanted to highlight this, uh, you know, this perspective that I had on this. So what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I'd like to add to that, Pia. In fact, not only is that um, true, but you're saying the pandemic, you know, the pandemic itself, according to multiple reports of the UN, of various governments, the pandemic itself is a part of our changing climate and our changing um, um, by, you know, the loss of biodiversity and all of that. Yes. They are saying now that there are, there are undiscovered viruses under the melting Arctic ice. Yes, yes I can. Everywhere else, and that more and more viruses are being transmitted from animals to humans. In fact, this is not even the first, mm -hmm. you know, and it certainly isn't the last. We've had, you know, we've had swine flu, we've had bird flu, we've had AIDS, we've had all kinds of warnings of things which have not quite shut down the world, but have pointed the way. And they are, the UN has also said that the next pandemics will be worse. So I don't know how we are segregating ourselves into rural yeah. and urban. And we're all men and women, everyone's affected. And it's just that women, because of their role that they play, um, as you just said, in the household chores and looking after children and making sure that the family is kept together, face the burden worse. And also because they have less control in policy making, which gives rise to this climate change, yeah. our voices are not heard. So I think that's really what I would like to say, that we need to start speaking up. Absolutely. Absolutely. For, for the whole world, men and women, but keeping in mind maybe that we understand certain issues which the women are facing through a personal experience, which is perhaps slightly different from yeah. this experience. Yeah. I think this point that you just mentioned, Samara, I think this is, for me, I think this is the most important thing, that women are really experiencing the issues of the world 
through their personal experiences in their micro environments, in whichever set, set setting that they are based, whether they're staying on their own or with families, whatever you know backgrounds they come from, their experience is very personal. And I think it is through their personal experience in their micro environment that they're processing the issues happening at a more uh, global like you know space. So I think uh, that's a very important uh, point to remember. Now, um, the thing is that in uh, uh, yeah. so uh, for instance, like I was reading about uh, Northeast Nigeria, uh, where there's a terrorist group called Boko Haram that primarily targeted women who had been displaced from their land because there was a drought that happened. And they used violence to control like the limited resources and you know, like the first, the first victims of this whole situation were women. So this really like made me kind of pause and think about it because we don't really even think or visualize the extent to which harassment can happen on women when there is a climate in induced like uh, instability. So this was something which I found to be, you know, uh, also pretty much in sync with what, what you mentioned about uh, the issue which you faced during the San Mafia, you know, uh, incident. So, yeah, so I would like to uh, know more from you about your perspective on this. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, if you're displaced, you're more vulnerable than if you're uh, secure in your household. Yes. And yeah. When you're displaced and you know you have children to look after mm. and you know that responsibility then your mm. ability to own is less in fact the yeah. UN studies even say that for example mm. women die in greater numbers because they're not taught maybe how to swim in case case of a flood and again we think of floods and droughts as being something far away you know they're, they're happening in wherever Uttarakhand and you know Assam and stuff like that but Mumbai was hit by the first cyclone in over a hundred. Of course, it narrowly missed. Mm -hmm. It came suddenly close enough that everybody was worried. You know, I moved all my pots out of my window and put them down in case there were heavy winds. And, you know, I didn't want to risk it. So certainly it came close enough that we know now that there is a possibility of something like this actually hitting Mumbai. There have been other cities, the other areas very close to all our cities where these things have happened, even we've had floods even within Mumbai, um, you know, which have been escalating over the years. And now it's become routine that every year Mumbai floods, yeah. which it wasn't earlier and we've kind of got used to it. So mm -hmm. maybe, you know, these things happen gradually and you become used to them and you don't realize that, no, it's no longer in Uttarakhand yeah. or somewhere else, it's here. Absolutely. It's just that it's gradually catching up. I think the COVID lockdown was very interesting because it was not gradual. And yeah. that's the only thing that really distinguishes it from the other events to which we have got used to. You know, we've had uh, illnesses, say AIDS, which changed the way many people lived. It changed everything about... Um, yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, I totally like agree with you on this scenario. Children had it. No, yeah. it was a huge thing and it changed the way we lived. Every pandemic has changed the way you live. And once again, it's the UN who's saying again and again that this has been a warning to us. It's not an event which happened and it's, you know, it's over when we get a vaccine. No, this event, we've had many previous warnings, but this too is a warning. It's not a final event. Yeah. And it's something which tells us very clearly that when we build back from where we are, we need to build back in a better, more sustainable way. And Absolutely. that means many things. It doesn't mean sustainable in any isolation. The UN, the latest report, which is the most comprehensive blueprint of the UNEP says mm -hmm. that every issue is linked and you have yeah. to tackle them together. If yeah. you don't tackle them together, we are, we are not tackling them at all. So whether it's pollution or climate change or women's issues or any issues, these issues are together. I think the only thing that we can maybe determine for ourselves is 
where we want to place our focus, because obviously if you think of tackling enormous things like climate change and pollution and this and women's rights and everything together, it's just too much to tackle. So we can maybe plug into various aspects of it, but definitely we need to know that these things are not isolated. Absolutely. And perhaps this is the reason why, although this is something I've known for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, in the course of my work, mm -hmm. I decided now to yeah. talk about it and write about it, you know, and, and put it out there that these things also are together. Absolutely. I think that the fact that you have directed our awareness to this uh, to the you know the, the combined nature of the problem is really really significant so thank you so much for doing that so um there was something which i read which really caught my attention uh and it was called sex for fish okay so this is a iucn report actually which talked about how uh, you know an increase in temperatures and ocean acidification led to a decline in fish. So women who were, to were totally dependent on fish for their livelihood, they were forced to sell their bodies or you know, sell their sex for access to fish. And that was really, really like disturbing because again, we don't really, you know, in our daily lives, even think of how rising temperature can actually lead to women having to sell their bodies so that they can get fish in this particular instance, just to be able to feed their families and look after their basic sustenance. So this, I mean, something like this really, really, you know, made me sit up and take note. And I'm like, you know, how are we not seeing this problem in conjunction? Then I was also reading about how in Malawi, the disruptions of climate change could actually create 1.5 million child brides because it's all access uh, to resources, you know, obviously, which is driving this kind of problem. Then I was also reading about how in Australia, uh, after the bushfires happened recently, there was a huge spike in domestic abuse cases at home. Then uh, there was another incident that I read about in uh, about the Rohingya refugees who are in the Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh, which is basically in a coastal area which is more susceptible to natural disasters like flooding and soil erosion. So if floods or landslides are to happen there because of climate change, then it will be women who are refugees living over there who will be like bearing the brunt of this whole issue because already there is a huge spike in cases of sexual assault in uh, you know, these kind of campsites. So they will be the ones who are gonna be worst affected. So these were some of the cases which I read about and you know, it really, really got me thinking even more. So I would like to know, you know, your insight a little bit more about um, how you think we can actually prevent these kind of catastrophes from happening in the future. Well, I think prevention is better than cure. And so, of course, we, uh -huh. you know, we all know that, uh, um, I think we've just discussed it also, that women are always the worst affected because they are the ones who have to do what it takes to make sure that their families survive. You know, and if that means sex work, then it means sex work. Yes. And it, you know, it means whatever it means. If it means something else, migration, you know, I think climate migration is going to be the next big thing. Yes. And certainly. if it isn't already, I mean, I know that when countries like IT, for example, were destroyed by uh, cyclones, yes. people had to go somewhere. And the thing of, you know, not having access to clean water and not having access to food and stuff, these are things which women have to deal with and they get abused too in the bargain because when there's a shortage, then everybody suffers, you know, the, the husband, the wife and the family, the kids, everybody else and whether they're old people or whatever. But finally, the brunt of it usually comes on her to make sure that something happens and you don't know what that something is, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Has, she, she is the one who will not let her kids go hungry most of the time. So it so naturally with every such disaster, these things are going to increase, not only for women, but disproportionately for women. And so I feel that, I mean, migration, abuse, these things we have all been highlighted during disasters and during the lockdown, which in itself is a disaster, one of the disasters we've been facing 
among floods, droughts, whatever else we, you know, you have, have you. So, so I think COVID again has played this important role of bringing the possibility of having been forced to manage a disaster into our cities and making us more conscious and aware that this is not somebody else's issue. Yeah. And they're the same wherever you are. They may be at slightly different scales. Obviously, you cannot compare a Syrian refugee living in some, um, or you know, some in some Iraq or somewhere like that, living in in human conditions with the kind of things that we have had to do in Bombay. But certainly, women who had never done housework in their lives did find themselves doing housework. Even women, sometimes who were old or ill or not actually able to do that physical labor if for no reason, because we've never had that experience of having to do it, you know? So you might not count that in the same breath at all as the village woman who loses her home or the Syrian refugee, but it's all on the same page. And so I just say that again, that it's women who will do what it takes to keep their families together. And if it's sex work, it's sex work. If it's, you know, something else, then it's something else, whatever. Uh, since you mentioned about Syria, uh, there's something which just came to my mind. Uh, so I had read that the, one of the main reasons for the whole you know, issue that happened in Syria was because of shortage of water and deple depletion of the water resources in the area, which did force uh, you know, people to displace themselves. And that led, because there was a vacuum created, it led to you know, certain organizations which started, you know, uh, doing activities which were illegal or uh, whatever, like went against human rights. So the origin of the Syria crisis also seems to have uh, been linked to uh, scarcity of water resources. So that was something which really stood out uh, for me. And during this pandemic, so that was of course- All Syria, wars been fought on scarcity. All wars have been fought because yes. of some scarcity of something or the other, and we are creating those scarcities now. Absolutely, absolutely. So like even during this pandemic, like I remember in my housing society, uh, and I think that was at the peak of summer, I think April or May. So obviously at that time, most of the housing societies went into a complete state of uh, you know, lockdown. Like they had their own rules about not letting people come in, go out, whatever. And since everybody was at home, which is not usually the case when people, some people go out to office and you know, like if they have a requirement for water or using the washroom, whatever, they are using water in other places as well. But during the peak of summer, when in any case, like the water, you know, there's a scarcity of water generally in the city, there was a lot of fear and concern that, you know, if there is a water shortage with everybody using water, and also because we were all washing our hands like multiple times during a day, how do we as a society also manage? So these were questions that we had not even addressed during that time. And it was obviously women in most of the homes who were doing the filling in of you know, huge uh, pans of water and keeping water in buckets. So the responsibility did come to women at a certain level to ensure that there was enough resources to get their family uh, going and you know, not having to be in a situation where you do not have enough water. And likewise with food also. I think most of us have dealt with this during the lockdown because there was obviously scarcity of ration and scarcity of vegetables and a lot of other things. So my thing also is that whether it's in Syria or whether it's in Mumbai, although the gravity of the problem could be a lot more, say in Syria or other remote areas, it's not like the same level of problem cannot happen even in like a posh building in Mumbai, in a housing society or wherever. So I think this pandemic has clearly exposed the kind of problems that can happen. So just wanted to like mention that this was my own observation a few months back. So, so Mera, going forward then, how, besides of course women trying to fund certain uh, initiatives which can help to create some sort of like a corpus, what, so, so like our group has mostly women travelers. So these are women who, uh, you know, travel to various places in India abroad. They have a good awareness of uh, what is happening around them. What messages would you specifically have for this uh, group of women that when they are traveling to other places, what, what are the things that they should keep their eyes like, you know, look out for? Uh, and once they come back to their home base, 
how can they use all of these experiences to create more sustainable environments in their micro environment well you know i think one of the the interesting things about travel is that everybody loves travel some people actually do it but others read about it and they say all books are travel books you know somebody said there are only two types of books love book, uh, romances and travel books and then someone else said no no they're only travel books Very so every book is a travel book and every experience. but when people come back from their travels most of the time at least pre lockdown the the focus was on what they saw what they experienced in a way of novelty you know the novelty of the place and it was very i mean of course it is very exciting and interesting to experience new things new ways new histories all that stuff but maybe people can keep an eye out also for how things are changing now and start talking bringing that into the travel discussion that because of climate change maybe if you visit i don't know a forest in or a mountain in the himalayas or you go trekking or wherever you go you can figure out what it was like and what it's like now and draw those comparisons and start talking about that right. and maybe if since if you're women oriented you could particularly start talking about women's experiences and correlate them with your own you know uh, as a traveler of multiple places i think that would actually be such an interesting project on its own if someone would do that so i mean maybe if i go to a place i don't just want to hear about the beautiful building and the weather and you know what you wore and um, you know what you did and what you ate but maybe i'd like to know more about how it's changing and how it's going to impact you in future and maybe what you've seen of the place in the past and what you know what people think can be done and maybe if these experiences can be put together we'll get a better wider picture in which all of us can engage even if we don't physically travel that's a brilliant suggestion sumera i'm certainly going to see how you know i can at my personal level implement this so that's that's going to be like a small thing which i can look at today and uh, yeah because you know, these days everything is on social media so people if they read this on social media i'm sure it will have some impact you know people absolutely. want to know Uh, and uh, they so they get the second hand experience of that which i think would be you know very interesting really and uh, how can one start preparing their micro environment that is their home environment their immediate say building or society how does one start uh, you know kind of uh, changing things in their environment and also start preparing for the worst case scenario because you know we've already seen one example right now with covid how something can happen so suddenly that we are totally unprepared uh, i'm just going to mention one one more example here like you mentioned about how the the storm happened in mumbai right like it really it not only missed mumbai you know but it still like had a bit of impact so my home was literally in the rain in the line of uh, i mean i i saw a bit of the storm literally outside my window with very very high wind velocities i have never experienced that kind of wind velocity in all these years that i've been staying in mumbai and i remember there was a big like uh, neem tree just outside my house outside my window and it there was a point where it really started uh, you know brushing against my house and i stay on the topmost apartment uh over looking uh, like very close to the coastal region towards the sea like i could hear the creaking of the beams at one point and i got really really nervous because i i figured that you know most houses in mumbai are not even prepared to deal with this kind of storm simply because we haven't had to deal with it for 100 years does not mean that these kind of things cannot happen especially if climate change is going to take you know uh come come to us at its full fury in the future we also got to be prepared in many other ways as well so what are the simple tips that you would have for women specifically to start also paying attention to their home environment and uh do certain things to also stay prepared in case of you know any sort of uh, climate related disturbance that can suddenly happen you know if i had this answer i think i would be <laughs> yeah because we we don't know what that climate disturbance could be and i at least i don't think you can prepare for something you have no idea about we only know that 
we have yeah. been warned that the seas are rising, that Mumbai and cities like Mumbai will be underwater by 2050. Okay. All these things we know. So it's difficult to say because in an, we don't have any disaster management plan worth speaking about in Mumbai. Um, we don't. So I don't think there's a simple answer to this. Um, but I do think that being engaged in the conversation might be the first step because we are getting policies which we have no say in and we are only facing the effects and in even preparing for disaster management, we at an individual level, it's really difficult to know what, what to say besides saying, you know, be, be aware, recycle garbage. Of course, all those things, I think I'm not going to repeat because I'm yeah. sure everyone here knows those things, save water, you know, all that stuff, all that stuff, which is obvious. And, but more than that, I think we, we need, you know, just like the women's movement became a movement because women started speaking up for other women who had faced issues. So I think climate change is an issue where all of us need to engage and say that these are issues which are our issues. They affect us directly and we will have a say. I would say because the policies are made by people who are mostly men, who mostly, uh, you know, and this is internationally, not only in India. I mean, most of the policies, I mean, of course, are made by men. They're implemented by men, but we bear the brunt of it, women. So I think we need to engage in whatever way we can. That's, the, that's all I can say, whether it's, you know, through social media or through photography or through writing or through letters or organizing or, you know, community groups. Whatever you do is not worthwhile. I think that's the first thing I'd like to say that, you know, take a small action. It doesn't matter. You don't know what small action leads to what, but take that action because that small action is better than not taking an action. You know, every one of us impact the world we live on positively or negatively. And so at least try to be yourself a positive factor before going on and trying to make a larger change. And, you know, that's all I can say, because if it affects you ultimately, you are going to face it. So it's better to take it up now and you do what, whatever you think right. I don't think anyone has an answer as to what you can do if this really happens. I think basically people are just hoping for the best that this will not happen. But we aren't working towards making it not happen. Again, the UN says that we are not on target to meet any of the climate change targets. And we can only do it if we take drastic measures. The UN Secretary General said declare a state of climate emergency in every country mm -hmm. at the end of 2020. So whatever that means, if we are in a state of climate emergency, then we need to take emergency preventive action. It's not back to life back to normal post pandemic, because if we do that, we are going to have more of these events and we are going to actually go backwards in the hope that we're going forward. So I think the only thing I can say is to people is open your eyes, look around you, recognize what's happening and do whatever you can. I don't think anything will be wasted. And, you know, if you don't know what to do, then maybe if you, if something interests you, it, as I, you know, as I also said that every issue is connected. So it doesn't matter if you're not interested particularly in climate change or you're interested in, I don't know, pollution or in education, they're all connected. Or in they're all interconnected. But keep your mind open that climate change is a thing and it, it's connected to all these issues and do yes. what you can there. Absolutely. You know, engage with other people working in the larger sphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, since there is absolutely no doubt about the fact that climate change does impact women and, you know, especially women in the lower socioeconomic bracket, much more than it will affect men simply because of the way society is structured. Do you also have any uh, suggestions for men who are listening to this uh, about how they can play a role in ensuring gender equality in their own micro environment? Like just to give one uh, thought, like example, that uh, in many cases it is boy, boy children who are taught how to swim and uh, in many cases, like girls are not really, it's not too much of a pressure on them to learn things like life skills, like swimming or say even something like driving. 
So do you think that uh, if fathers or husbands, they play more of a role in gender equality at home and equipping their uh, girl children also with some life skills, it could go a long way in prepping them for, you know, having, having in their, uh, you know, uh, skill set, diverse life skills, which could come into handy if, in case of an emergency later. Well, of course, I mean, I think this is part of a larger discussion on women anyway, that women do need to find equal footing across the board in everything from education to life skills to yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. um, they, women do have some, some skills, which I would say men actually don't. Uh, you know, the skills of making sure that families remain uh, intact very often, you know, in spite of a lot of devastating things, caring, all those skills women do have. But I would say it's not just teaching girls how to, how to equip themselves with skills which are more traditionally considered male, but yeah. to equip boys with skills which are considered feminine. So both ways, I think yes. everybody needs to uh, reach out and recognize that although because the, of the way society is set up, women are facing a lot of the burden of such disasters disproportionately, but ultimately it's not that anybody is not facing it. The men are facing it too. And maybe if they realize that their women are equal partners and can be, um, you know, can be alongside them, so they tackle it together, then I think just like with every other thing in the world, we'll be a better society anyway. <laughs> So thank you so much, Sumera. This was so eye-opening at so many different levels. And uh, I mean, I'm sure that many people who, you know, uh, want to be a part of this may also want to get in touch with you actually to see how they can also help. So uh, can you tell us what is the best way for people to connect with you in case they want to reach out to you? Well, I'm on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Insta, which I barely use because I, uh, I'm trying to use, but I'm not so good at. And of course, my num my phone number is you can you can WhatsApp me or email me. Um, I think so. My my Facebook is Sumaira Abdulali. My Twitter is Sumaira Abdulali. Mm -hmm. My uh, email is Sumaira Abdulali at yahoo.com, and my phone number is 9821520805. Um, that's the same number for WhatsApp. So please reach out to me. Um, sometimes, you know, as I think because it's a mobile number, sometimes I find it difficult to answer because, you know, but, but I mean, whenever I can, I will call you back or if you send me a message, I'll definitely uh, respond as best I can. Um, sometimes people call, I have to say, and think, that I can solve their problem, but very often that's really not the case, just to yeah, say, yeah. but I'd be very happy to talk to anybody, yes. help them, because these are things all of us have to be engaged yes. in. Yes. I don't think I have answers which are better or more, um, you know, than any anybody else, but certainly it's a conversation and a discussion which I would love to be a part of. And Pia, if you do this thing of kind of putting it out there for travelers to start talking about yes. their observations yes. on climate change, I would love to, you know, be involved in that too. Certainly, certainly. This is something I certainly want to do and I'm going to get in touch with you for more details on how we can do something on this because I think this is the need of the hour. So there is just no two ways about not doing it anymore. So yes, on that note, Sumera, once again, thank you so much for you know, speaking to all of us and sharing your wisdom and experience on this topic. And I wish you all the very best for the wonderful work that you're doing. And we will continue to stay in touch and see how we can form a community of uh, people who can take this issue up further. Yeah. So, thank you. And, and also, Pia, I forgot my website. Please go to my website. You know, uh, website is www.awazfoundation.org. Awaz is A-W-A-A-Z. So, you know, there's a lot of information there. If you're interested in any of the topics I've been working on, please do go through that as well. Thank you so much, Sumera. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Pia. Thank you so much. Really. 
nice to talk to you and I look forward to doing Thank this. Thank you so much. Nice. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.